Great. Well, thank you all for joining us. Um, the Columbian is pleased to welcome candidates for Lieutenant Governor. I am Greg Jane, the editorial page editor, and I think we'll go around. We'll, I'll let uh, everybody else introduce themselves. Start with Craig. Hi, I'm Craig Brown. I'm the Columbian's editor. And the Scott. Oh, go ahead. Scott Campbell, uh, retired publisher of the Columbian and still a member of the editorial board. Great. Uh, ben. Uh, ben Campbell, current publisher of the Columbian and new member of the editorial board. And then Jody. Editorial board. So, and then uh, Kelly, go ahead. I'm Kelly. I cover politics for the Columbian and I'll be covering this meeting, but I won't be participating. Great. And then now we get to the important part, the candidates. Um, Please uh, take just one to two minutes, give us a brief background um, and explain why you're running for this position. And then we'll get on to specific um, policy questions. And we'll start with Danny. Thank you, Greg. Uh, I am a lifelong Washingtonian, born and raised there, born at the site of the Black Angus restaurant on 13th Street. And if you know what that really means, and you've been <laughs> around Vancouver a while. Uh, what I bring to this race is a unique breadth and depth of experiences. I was elected to five terms in the State House from the 17th District, uh, focused mostly on education. I was co-chair of the Education Committee, chair of the Historic Basic Education Subcommittee, and was asked by my colleagues to serve as Majority Leader. I was asked by Governor Gardner later to serve as his Chief of Staff, which is basically Chief Operating Officer of State Government. When he retired and took the ambassadorial posting to WTO, a colleague and I co-founded and stood up TVW and built it out of whole cloth. I was its first longtime uh, CEO. I then entered the private sector uh, upon retirement from TVW, retirement which I failed. I co-founded a company with two employees and we built it up to 300 before we sold it. Uh, and then at some point, I decided that I wanted to re-enter public service. And so I ran for Congress, uh, was defeated in 2010, as you all recall, and then ran again in 2012 and was elected and have served the last uh, eight years in Congress. I'm the only member of the Financial Services Committee for a thousand miles. I focus mostly on monetary policy, the Export-Import Bank, housing policy, and consumer protection. And a few years ago, then-Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi asked me to join the uh, permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. I'm running for Lieutenant Governor for the same reason that anybody would run for any office, whether it's school board or President of the United States, and it's to make a difference. Great, thank you. Question. I have a quick yeah. question. You went to Columbia River High School too, right? Yes, and if we're going down the chieftain mascot route, <laughs> this is gonna be a painfully long. I went, I went, I went, I was at uh, Columbia River I won't say cheap anymore because it's going to be changed, but we're not going to go down that road. But I just remember that you did go to Columbia River, and I did too. It's <laughs> <laughs> right. unusual upbringing that way. I went all seven years to Lakeshore Elementary School and then to Jason Lee yeah. and then to Columbia River. As a matter of fact, Jody, I did something nobody ever uh, recalls doing. For a very brief period of time, there was a Columbia River Junior High School until Jason Lee opened. So I actually attended Columbia River Junior High School before Jason Lee and then Columbia River High School. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> the good old days. Yes. <laughs> okay. Of the chieftains. But uh, <laughs> thank you. And Marco, go ahead. Well, it's so good to be with you. Uh, it's a good reminder that as much as Washington has grown, we're still a big, small town in many respects. So <laughs> fun to see the connections. I'm a lifelong Washingtonian, a state senator, and a college professor. Uh, running to be our next lieutenant governor. You know, growing up, my dad was a carpenter, my mom was a school lunch lady, and so I learned early on the value of hard work and also the value of getting a good education uh, to succeed. I was the first in my family to go to college, uh, to Georgetown University. I uh, had a great experience there, uh, but also took on a boatload of student debt for that experience and came back home, helped start a small construction company with my dad, uh, and then through that got involved in uh, local government was on the Chamber of Commerce board and we felt like the city council wasn't listening uh, and so I said you know somebody should really run for the city council and when you say things like that at the chamber board they say that's a really great idea why don't you go do it and so that launched me on a journey of public service I've been in the legislature for the last 12 years uh, the last six in the Senate uh, and am today our majority floor leader helping 
uh, to guide the work of the state Senate, um, both uh, in actual session and also guide the planning towards uh, the future as we look at remote and hybrid sessions to continue to do our work. I've really focused in on uh, that core priority of education, on creating jobs, on addressing the climate crisis, addressing the student debt crisis, and really uh, thinking about what we could do to expand healthcare access and affordability for all Washingtonians. Um, to live in Washington right now is really to get priced out more and more. Child care is out of cost, out of reach, housing is out of reach, education and tuition uh, feel out of reach to families. We've got to do more to bring down the cost, make it affordable to live in Washington, make sure that everybody has a safe home, make sure that everybody has access to education and opportunity. That's what led me to run in this race. Excited to have the endorsement of our current Lieutenant Governor, Cyrus Sabib, as well as 22 of my 28 Senate Democratic colleagues, and uh, excited to have a conversation with you today as well. Great, thank you, and thank you both for joining us. Um, I, I want to start out with a, a general question is, what, what do you see as the most significant role for the Lieutenant Governor? Is it presiding over the Senate? Is it uh, developing policy? Is it pushing the governor's policy? Uh, what approach would you take? And we'll start with Marco. You know, I think it's really a combination of the things you've mentioned. When uh, the legislature is in session, the most important role the lieutenant governor has is serving as president of the Senate and chair of the Senate Rules Committee. And that's part of why I think that I have some unique qualifications for this role, having served as our floor leader, having been a part of the leadership team that's been delivering uh, change for the last six years. Um, I'm excited to bring those relationships, that energy to this work. When the legislature is not in session, though, I do think that the lieutenant governor has an important role in helping advance policy on economic development and trade issues, on higher education and being a voice on the issues that are important to Washingtonians. Uh, Cyrus uh, Habib, our current Lieutenant Governor, has really uh, worked on growing the portfolio and has uh, done some excellent work in higher education. Um, you know, majority of the bills uh, that made it to the governor's desk on higher ed policies this year really came from ideas that his office had been working on. I think that um, we are in a moment of crisis. Everybody needs to be pulling together to find our way out of this. And I think when we're not in session, the lieutenant governor has a critical role to play in advancing economic development, job growth, focusing on education and workforce training as a piece of that, uh, making sure that this office is contributing uh, to the solutions we need to find. Great, thank you. Uh, Denny, uh, what do you see as the role of, of this position? Well, the most important role is the one least discussed, and that's to be the insurance policy in case the governor ever gets hit by a bus. Hopefully <laughs> that never gets invoked, but as you know, constitutionally, the lieutenant governor would sure. automatically ascend to the office of governor. Uh, next to that is its highest profile responsibility. By constitution, the lieutenant governor is the president of the Senate and the presiding officer. I think this is a particularly important job at this time because, frankly, I think as we've all observed, civic discourse is degraded in this country deplorably. And there isn't anyone that is in a better position, I think, to strike a tone of civility and fairness than the person who uh, objectively and fairly applies the rules of the Senate. And then thirdly is kind of the other duties as assigned or self-assigned. Marco began to get into this. Uh, assigned would include the chairing of the Bipartisan Bicameral Committee on uh, Economic Development and International Relations. I think that's going to be a particularly wonderful opportunity to lend some effort to our need to rebuild this economy in the midst of this recession, which I predict will still be underway. In fact, I think one of the ways to look at this is what is the context of the January 2021 session? And it is going to be a very difficult and challenging one. We will still have the COVID pandemic. We will have a need to rebuild the economy, hopefully in a, where, in a way that more broadly shares prosperity and deals with some overdue needs in this country, uh, and to do so in a sustainable, sustainable way. And of course, as a consequence of the recession, we're going to confront the biggest budget challenge that we've had since the 1981-83 session. Sure. Um I wonder if I can just ask a question yeah. about uh, at this at this point about um, the uh, governor's decision to not have a special se session uh, at, at this time. Is that the right call? Would you make that same decision? You have to tell us who goes first, Scott. Denny, go ahead and go first. <laughs> uh, earlier is better. Uh, look, I've seen this movie before, and 1981-83 was a good example. Uh, unfortunately. Uh, Governor Spellman, 
kind of denied the problem was as severe as it was. And we kept warning them, this is bad, it could get worse. And so it's really simple math. Here's the biennium. And the deeper into the biennium you get when you get around to solving the problem, either the deeper the cuts have to be or the higher the tax increases have to be. So basically, earlier is better. Now, I'm, I'm, not going to, I'm not going to second guess Governor Inslee because I don't know what legislative leadership have told them. The rumor is that three of the four caucuses were good to go, but one of them wasn't. And right. I frankly don't know which one that is. But the, but the reality is, in terms of being able to solve this problem and reduce pain later, earlier would have been better. Mm -hmm. Marco? Yeah. And, and I would say, in my experience, uh, if we're going to make a special session successful, we need to start that dialogue before the legislature convenes. We don't have the luxury of taking 30 days to hash things out. And, and I have seen uh, the beginning of productive dialogue between uh, House and Senate. I know that Senator Billig's been in touch with Senator Schessler on our side, and I know that the speaker uh, and our majority leader are, are in frequent contact. So I think the beginning is there. We also candidly need to make sure that it's safe for the legislature to meet. And so we spent uh, some time over the summer ironing out those details. I feel confident either in a hybrid or an all uh, virtual format that the Senate uh, could meet. I know the House is doing a parallel process. So I, as much as um, you know, it would be nice to sort of snap a finger and get everybody back in. It does take work to get prepared for that. Uh, I am hopeful that here in the coming weeks we'd be ready for that. Now, if we get to October and we're, you know, right when ballots are dropping, that might not be the most opportune time to try and have a special session. But I agree with Denny. We need to get in there before January, begin to make some of the tough decisions. We are fortunate that we have uh, the rainy day fund that provides us a little bit of runway. And I'm, you know, on my knees every night hoping that uh, Denny and his colleagues in the House and Senate get us some more help, um, because those two critical pieces uh, would really make a difference now. It doesn't look like uh, Speaker Pelosi and Senator McConnell are, are finding a meeting of the minds, uh, but I'm hoping that we can get some agreement. It's also worth noting that the unemployment assistance we saw uh, in the first round made a difference. We actually saw revenue collections in June and in July come in over uh, the dismal predictions we had uh, back in in April, May. So when Americans are getting this relief, when that $600 was flowing, it actually was beginning uh, to put people back to work and help our economy. We desperately need to keep the money flowing. We need that lifeline on. All of these pieces need to come together and we should get in there as quick as possible to take action. Now, that being said, when the legislature does get together, be it this year or in January, what should they do? What should the approach be? Uh, Marco? Well, we have already told our members uh, in the Senate that we are not going to be able to pass the same volume of bills. Because of the virtual hybrid format, uh, it just takes longer to get through the process, and we only have the 105 days uh, that the Constitution has assigned us. So I think we will be laser-like focused on the budget and COVID recovery. And then I think there will be a really honest conversation about equity and social justice and police reform uh, that have been born out of the many tragedies, you know, uh, most notable in our minds are George Floyd and Manny Ellis. Uh, and now, of course, what happened in Kenosha with Jacob Blake. Um, so we clearly need to address uh, these issues. But I think a free ranging long session like we saw two years ago where there's, um, you know, 300 different policies addressed is not uh, going to be possible with uh, the constraints we have. So we'll focus in on the budget and on getting the economy restarted, on supporting our smallest businesses, our nonprofits that have been left out of some of the relief efforts so far, and uh, then focusing on how do we, what are those steps we can take right now uh, to create a more just, a more equitable uh, state for everybody. So do you think in, in uh, speaking of the budget, does that mean more taxes, less spending, a combination of both? I think we need, it will be a combination of all of the above. I think we need a clear picture on what the federal support will be um, because the rainy day fund accounts for, you know, maybe 40% of the gap. If we could get, you know, the House passed a bill at the, uh, over the summer that would have gotten us probably enough to cover the remainder of our gap, uh, candidly, over the next three years. Uh, it, it remains to be seen what the Senate and what an, a future administration agree to. But if there is a delta left, then I think it should be a mixture of, efficiencies uh, and some new revenue. You know, we've been talking about turning our tax code right side up. It's uh, most regressive in the country. So I think this is an opportunity to lean into some of that work, but also uh, to make sure that we're efficient in the dollars we have. I served through the last recession when only 7% 
of the gap was filled with new revenue. That was clearly unbalanced. I think we need a mixture of reserves, federal support, some uh, progressive new revenue, and some efficiencies and cuts uh, where, where needed. Obviously, education and some of those core functions, uh, especially the safety net with so many families struggling, uh, need to be protected. But uh, there, there is space there to find uh, savings as, as we need it. Uh, Denny, how should the legislature approach it? So, Greg, you really asked two questions, how they should approach it sure. in general, which is the first question Marco answered, and then the budget. So which are you asking? The, um, the budget. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, so largely agree with Marco, who I thought laid it out pretty well. Uh, I do think, however, it's important to state that the efficiencies that we will be pursuing of necessity is really a habit that we ought to be in every legislative session. That is to say, never letting up with laser-like focus on how we can do, as it were, more with less and still provide uh, the essential services, our constitutional responsibilities, not damaging the institutions that help our economy grow, and above all else, protecting the vulnerable. We need to do that at every turn. Uh, I think it's important that we all participate in that. As, as it turns out, the lieutenant governor's office is very small, but has grown considerably in the last few years. I think the lieutenant governor ought to participate in these increased efficiencies and belt tightening, as it were, uh, to set an example that I'm committing to do that here. And now, uh, the thing I think I would elaborate on. Oh, wait, when you say that belt tightening, do you, do you mean shrinking the lieutenant governor's office or? Yeah, yeah. Well, okay. Uh, the other thing that I, I think bears mentioning is not just to look at these crises, and they are crises. It's a COVID crisis. It's an economic crisis. Uh, recession crises, and it's a budget crisis, as uh, something that doesn't contain within its seeds opportunities. Uh, I think we really need to look upon it that way. Uh, let me give you a couple of examples. I think you probably all know that the American Society of Civil Engineers has deemed overall our infrastructure as warranting a D plus grade, a failing grade, uh, long overdue increased investments in our infrastructure, which will give us an opportunity, I think, to rebuild the economy in a fairer way and to establish a foundation for stronger growth going into the future. Uh, I think in terms of, for example, the need to address our housing crisis. We have a housing crisis in this country, and it's especially acute at the affordable housing level. We have a need to significantly increase in uh, uh, stormwater runoff. It's the number one cause of pollution in this country. We have uh, significant infrastructure needs that have gone uh, just crying for investment. And you all know better than most because you actually sit right on top of one of the major infrastructure needs in this state, and that's the new Columbia River crossing. You know, that northbound lane or that northbound bridge, which is set to close now for nine days, hopefully will help be a part of the long process of waking people up to the fact that we need to get with it. That span was built in 1970, and it is way, way, way overdue for increased investment. And lastly, I think I would say on the opportunity side, most economists now are coming to the conclusion that about one in four of the jobs we have lost in this recession aren't returning. One of the things we did not do in the last recession, uh, when, when there were significant reductions that Marco alluded to, is invest in skilling up. We need to make sure that we don't leave a lot of people behind permanently. And, you know, we just began to make some progress on this, frankly, to an increasingly enlightened monetary policy on the part of the Federal Reserve Board, where they allowed the labor supply to get tight. And what that did is bring traditionally marginalized people into the workforce and also began to put some upward pressure on wages for the first time in 40 years because wages had been stagnant. So now is not the time to look those people in the eye who've just begun to uh, become absorbed by the, uh, by the labor market and to begin to get some uh, wage increases to say, sorry, you're now on your own. Uh, that's why it's important to, yes, protect the vulnerable, our paramount responsibility, but also to not take an ax to uh, our higher education system and our community and technical college system. There are opportunities here if we will but view them that way. So, and just uh, want to go back for a second. Um, so as Lieutenant Governor, would you promise that you will get us a new bridge? 
<laughs> so I, um, I think there are a couple of prerequisites uh, to getting us a new bridge, which we, which we need. I, I, I do promise that I'll go down fighting. You know, I, I want to, I, I, I want to remind you all that when I ran for Congress, I came out four square in favor of a new Columbia River crossing, uh, and it met with considerable resistance 10 years ago from certain quarters. Uh, no doubt played some role in my defeat, although I'd like to attribute it to the red wave that I was experiencing in 2010. I promised, I promised to fight very, very hard for it. But here are the two prerequisites, Greg, and I know that we've thought about this. Uh, we need to figure out a way to have better bi-state uh, coordination and cooperation on this. You know, when I was a kid, Vancouver was represented in the state house by a man named Bill Klein, a local attorney. And, uh, oh, quit nodding your head, Scott. You don't remember Bill. <laughs> uh, but, but Bill used to say the next time we have a chance to draw state boundaries, we should draw them down mountain uh, summits, not on rivers, because people tend to congregate on rivers. And, of course, that sets up this friction of uh, these multi-jurisdictional issues. So number one, we really have to have a better uh, sense of cooperation and collaboration with our neighbors to the south. And number two, we need to continue to work to get, and I'm just going to be real blunt about this, people, people in Clark County on the same page. And I'll tell you why. Uh, if you sit in the legislature uh, on transportation committees, I think Marco once did, if you have a large transportation package come before you and you're trying to figure out how to get the votes. And you've got some project over here, which is really expensive. And the new Columbia River Crossing is gonna be really expensive. And the community is not together on it. It is absolutely a perfect excuse not to produce. Right. Now that's it's, not- We when, found that out seven years ago now. And continuing. And fortunately, sure. Annette was able, and I presume with Marcos help, I frankly don't know, to get some money in there to continue uh, sure. for the development of the Columbia River Crossing. But those are the two things that I think need to happen in order for us to do this. And Lord knows we need to do it. The I-5 bridges are on the major artery between San Diego and Vancouver, BC. And uh, Lord knows what would happen to commerce and our communities if, uh, if the northbound, if the older bridge, the 1917 bridge uh, were to fail. I actually remember when the new bridge was open uh, I was a very small child, uh, but I knew because mom and dad liked to drive over to Jansen Beach every Saturday to buy groceries because they didn't have to pay sales tax, which was <laughs> then levied on groceries, and buy cigarettes because they had a lower <laughs> cigarette tax, but I didn't so, just admit that. Uh, uh, Marco, as lieutenant governor, will you promise that you'll get us a new bridge? <laughs> well, as a Washingtonian, I think we've got to deliver that bridge. You know, uh, a ton of my groceries come up uh, through that same corridor, sure. so this is a... Uh, statewide uh, infrastructure. Uh, I'll be candid. I've also got a bridge that uh, I need to replace at the US 2 I-5 intersection that impacts uh, my constituents. So, and we now have a West Seattle bridge that needs a replacement. So, you know, I think part of this is creating a statewide vision and uh, talking about infrastructure as part of the lifeblood of what's keeping our economy going. Um, you know, if we're going to keep Boeing, if we're going to keep these global companies here, we've got to have world-class infrastructure in order to stay competitive. So I think that's part of the case that we make. I, I agree with Denny that, you know, folks in the local community have to get together. I also remember the viaduct where, you know, a quarter or a third of Seattle hated uh, the solution. So at some point, you know, you also need leaders, and I, I salute Annette for being there, who are ready to just move forward and recognize we're not going to get 100 percent agreement. If we get 65 percent agreement, the 65 percent of us need to go and do this thing and just let the naysayers be the naysayers. They're always going to be there and move forward. And go to downtown Seattle, it's being transformed because, and I was proud to be a part of the team that helped pass that contentious bill through the house uh, in my second term in the house. Um, now it's there. And so I think that there's gonna be a little bit of a pull the bandaid off that needs to happen. The Lieutenant Governor does chair uh, an economic development and trade committee. And I would definitely wanna make infrastructure and projects like uh, the Columbia River Bridge, uh, you know, a centerpiece of what we're going to do to stay competitive. And we've got projects all over the state. When I helped write the 2015 Connecting Washington package with Democratic and Republican colleagues, we did um, economic development programs all over Washington. There's an opportunity here to create prosperity, uh, to help create jobs, and 
um, in this moment, you know, to get people back to work at a time when they need it more than ever um, around this vision. And so I, I think bridges are always a good transportation metaphor, and we've got a heck of a lot of bridges that need to be fixed right now. So definitely uh, think it's an opportunity. Sure. I, I'm curious, want to uh, go off to the side a little bit here. Uh, you're both Democrats. Um, it, it, to a large extent, you seem to agree mostly on policy. How can voters differ between you? What, what's the difference? We'll start with Marco. Well, I think that there, you know, um, is a generational difference here. Uh, and I certainly appreciate uh, Denny's experience and his uh, public service that began before I was born. Um, but I think that there is a moment for a change uh, and there's a moment to pivot to the future. And it's no mistake that Maggie was elected to the Senate when he was 39 and Scoop was elected when he was 41. Our state has gone through this transition when we have put new dynamic future oriented leaders in position to grow and develop and to push our state into the future. I think, and uh, I'm sure Denny will disagree, but I think there's also a measure of urgency uh, that I bring. I, I think it's time to push harder and push farther uh, than what we think is possible right now. And whether it's getting to universal health care or getting bold climate action or tackling the tax code, I think this is a time for us to really push hard, really dream big, uh, and really accomplish some big things that can pay lasting rewards uh, for generations to come. If we can turn our tax system upside down, invest in that preschool to college pipeline, that's going to give us a skilled workforce that keeps us competitive. If we can invest in, in a carbon tax or a cap and invest program that funds critical infrastructure, green infrastructure, we will be competitive into the future. It's time to bite the bullet on some of these tough decisions and make the long-term call that's going to get us to where we need to go. Uh, and that is candidly what I offer and what I'm focused on. Uh, uh, Denny, how, how should voters differentiate? Well, it's true I'm older than Marco. Uh, it would be hard to hide even if I wanted to. Uh, but I think it's interesting to note that Marco has actually held elective office longer than I have. So in, in terms of who is the actually uh, longer serving member, uh, it would be Marco, not me. It's not by much, but it's true. I had I actually, So thanks for pointing that out. <laughs> uh, always glad to help me. Okay. Uh, I... I said it at the beginning, I think my depth and breadth of experience uh, is in fact something that is uh, very much needed at a time like this with the, with the triple crises that we're facing. Uh, I, I know what it's like to get things done. Uh, I have a record of accomplishment in the legislature where I authored the Historic Basic Education Act. Uh, I stand by my record serving as chief of staff to Governor Gardner. Uh, trust me, it's not easy to create out of whole cloth a statewide television network as I did. Uh, it's also not easy to conceive of a business idea and grow it from two employees to 300 uh, as I did. Uh, and I have a record of accomplishment in my time in Congress. I am the prime author of the reauthorization of the Job Creating Export Import Back Bank. Uh, I was the lead advocate and I think inarguably the most effective spokesperson on behalf of the new monetary policy, which uh, my friend Jay Powell is going to officially adopt next week uh, at the Federal Reserve. Uh, and I could go on and on about the number of things that we've been able to impact, including uh, in getting $100 billion in rent relief into the HEROES Act, which if we can persuade the Senate to adopt would have more of an impact on the ecosystem of housing than just about anything being uh, contemplated. So I think those things would serve us in very good stead. I, in fact, think that the job of Lieutenant Governor sits at the intersection of my life's journey and career experiences. Well, uh, along those Even lines- Even though I'm older than Marco. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, along those lines, you had, um, I, I believe you had announced you were retiring from Congress before this position came open. Um, if if um, Cyrus were running again, if Governor Inslee were not running for a third term, would you have run for governor? What made you decide to run for this? Well, asked and answered, Greg. I think the job lies at the intersection of okay. my my career experiences. The answer is no. Uh, okay. I would not have run for either governor but or in, against Cyrus. In, in okay, in in four years, would you consider running for governor? No, I, look, I've been very clear from day one. Uh, I believe that 
frankly, immodestly, hubris alert uh, that nobody's ever run for lieutenant governor before that's more prepared to step into being governor should that circumstance occur. Uh, and we all know that that's an openly discussed thing. Uh, but I announced on day one that I would not run for reelection as governor in November of 2021 should that circumstance arise. But I, I think it's important that you know why. Uh, first of all, I'm running for lieutenant governor because that's the job I want, not governor. Secondly, however, again, relating back to what I've tried to talk about and outline here, we will be confronting three crises, continuing COVID crisis, the economic uh, recession, and the budget challenge. And if you aren't already governor, or, or if you have not been running for governor, you cannot be airdropped into the second floor office of governor and confront those challenges while simultaneously uh, taking up the incredible uh, challenge of mounting a statewide campaign for governor. I know how all consuming that can be. And you can't do both if you're not already governor or if you haven't been run, running for governor. You just cannot do it and do justice to uh, what those three problems are going to present. I, I think the citizens of the state deserve somebody who, if they're in that circumstance, will devote their life to doing what they can to helping lead us through to the other side of that. And so my commitment is categorical and unequivocal. Uh, Marco, as we've established, you're younger than Denny. Um, would, would you view this as a stepping stone? What do you see down the road? You know, I, I think it's a long-term uh, stepping stone. It's not something that I look at in the short term. We haven't had a lieutenant governor uh, become governor uh, through this process in over 100 years. And Jay Inslee's made it very clear that it's not going to happen in the next four years. So um, I'm excited to step up, to build on the relationships that I built in the Senate, to be the president of the Senate, to chair the Rules Committee. Those are all institutions and people uh, and a place uh, that I appreciate and that I love to work in. And my colleagues, when I shared with them I was running, they said, oh, we don't want you to leave. And I said, I'm not leaving. I'm just going to a different part of the chamber. And that's the, I think the value of this is it grows and builds on the work I've been doing. It helps me bring those relationships, that new energy to this role. Um, and, you know, long down the line, uh, I, I think in four years, we've got uh, some great statewide officials, some great uh, county executives that really want to run. So I, I'm looking long term, I want to do a really good job at this, create opportunity uh, and if the people will give me a, a chance to do more in the future, that's great. But that this is the job that I want. This is what I'm excited to do. And it really does build on uh, the work that I've been doing and the relationships that I've built. And I believe and I can see the pathway to really deliver big change, which is what we need in this moment right now. So, Greg, yeah. you asked earlier what the differences were. I think, I think we did a pretty good job of laying those out. But I have to observe, because Marco and I have had this question and, and this conversation many times, he did not answer the question as to whether or not he would run for re-election as governor should Jay vacate the office. And he has never answered that question directly. You, so you mean if he won lieutenant governor and then Governor Inslee, say, was uh, took a cabinet position in January? Then, or got hit by a bus. Right. Then whoever's governor would have to run in November of 21. That's the law. Uh, uh, Marco, would you run? So Jay Inslee has said he's not leaving and uh -huh. he's in great health. So I'm not planning on him dying. So, I, you know, it, it's a hypothetical situation. I don't have an answer to what a hypothetical situation is. Um, I know that Jay's staying for his fourth or third term. He said that very clearly. Uh, I'm going to serve alongside him. I think it's a parlor game at this point. I'm focused on the job at hand, which is uh, to chair the Rules Committee to preside over the Senate to deliver change. Uh, Jay's not leaving. If he dies, like that just is a weird set of circumstances uh, that I think it's difficult to contemplate. If the governor died, I don't know what any of us would do in that circumstance. It would be unprecedented in my lifetime. So uh, he's not leaving to go to the cabinet. He said that unequivocally and clearly in the media. Yeah. Uh, the conjecture about it is it's fun parlor games. I'm focused on the job at hand. Now, um, in speaking of presiding over the Senate, should the uh, should the legislature be beholden to the Public Records Act? Marco? Absolutely. Yeah, so absolutely. And, and, you know, we spent time litigating this before the litigation had even ended. I was voluntarily 
uh, complying with the law and responding to public records requests. I'm glad that the Supreme Court gave us clarity um, so that we have an answer on, on how we move forward, and we're going to implement that. We have hired the public records staff, and we've done the work internally to make sure we can comply. Uh, it's actually a little ironic. It took so many years. I just fulfilled the original public records request that started the lawsuit um, just a couple weeks ago, and um, I, you know, the Republican doors, the Senate continues to work. It's just fine. Um, and I'm glad that we're complying with the law now. But it, but you did vote for SB 6617, didn't you? It was an attempt to try and find a pathway to end the litigation, um, but clearly uh, it didn't work. And so I'm glad the governor vetoed it. I'm glad we tried again the next year to have a conversation, but couldn't find a pathway. So I think this is a place where the Supreme Court did what they needed to do, which is I had colleagues who would never agree uh, to reasonable changes. Um, and so the Supreme Court gave us the answer. I started voluntarily complying once uh, it was really clear that we weren't going to be able to come to a, a workaround in the legislature. Um, and I'm glad that the court gave us an answer. And Denny, you say they should be beholden to Public Records Act? Absolutely, Greg. Uh, I have a career commitment to open government. I'm a proud recipient of the Coalition of Open Government's highest award, the James Madison Award. In fact, I would argue that TBW is in and of itself a great blow in the in the furtherance of transparency in state government. Would it, would you have voted for Senate Bill 6617? Absolutely not. Okay. Um, Craig, any questions? Sure. Uh, so for the five legislative districts that are in or touch Clark County are represented by members of the minority party. As the leader of the Senate, what would you do to make sure that their ideas are, are fully heard and considered? I'm sorry, I need to start with somebody. How about uh, starting with Denny? <laughs> so Call me old fashioned, I still believe in principled compromise. Uh, in fact, if you want to kind of scratch at some of my motivation for wanting to return to state government, then remember, based on my resume, my career has been principally focused on state government. It's where my heart is, as a matter of fact. Uh, part of my motivation is I see little green shoots of Olympia beginning to look too much like Washington, D.C. Uh, and I and I think we need to do what we can to keep that from happening. Uh, I think there is a degradation of civic discourse in this country that I think is disturbing and, and ill serves all of us, as a matter of fact. When I entered Congress, I told people I wanted to be held accountable for a couple of standards of behavior. I don't promise that I was always able to live up to these entirely, but I tried. And those two standards are, number one, you, you don't demonize people just because you disagree with them and you don't personalize things. Uh, and number two, you always look for common ground. So I think, Greg, that's the spirit of the answer to your question is you have to make sure that you're looking for common ground where you can find it. The story I love to tell is about when I went to Afghanistan on a CODEL with Joe Wilson, a Republican member from South Carolina. You will all remember Joe as the, the notorious you lie, uh, uh, person during President Obama's State of the Union. And I knew I didn't see the world hardly at all the same way that Joe did. One night we found ourselves out to dinner. He was sitting two chairs away from me. And I asked the person between us if I could switch. And I sat down next to Joe, whom I didn't know very well at all. And I said, Joe, we don't see the world the same way. But before we end this dinner, we're going to find something we can work on together. You've been a gracious leader of our delegation. I was in the minority at the, t at the time. You've reflected well on America, and I'm encouraged. Let's find something we can work together on. And we talked, and we talked, and we talked. And it turned out we came upon one of my pet issues, which was reauthorization of the Job Creating Export Import Bank. He threw in with me. We shook hands on it. He was good to his word. And the truth is that if you only agree with somebody on 1% of the issues, if you don't work hard to find that 1%, you're sure as heck never going to find 2%, let alone 3 let alone 5 So the answer to your question, Greg, really, quite directly is you look for common ground and you look hard and you don't personalize disagreements. Okay. 
Yeah. Marco, what and do you think? I, I agree with the spirit of what Denny's saying. And I think when I think about your the three Republicans in the Senate that I work with um, from Clark County, that comes to mind. I mean, Senator King and I um, helped write the largest transportation investment in our state history. And I convinced him to fund a lot more bike lanes and a massive transit expansion that wasn't his favorite going into it. Uh, in fact, the following year, I passed a pedestrian uh, safety advisory council. And he said, you know, I don't really like your bill, but I like you, so I'll pass it out of the Senate. Um, and it's now law to have that in place. And Ann Rivers and I worked on uh, helping support our, our small and growing cannabis industry, particularly uh, trying to get access to capital in safe ways and sort through uh, the mess of regulations that came out of the passage of the initiative. Linda Wilson uh, and I have worked on higher education issues. She was the chair of higher ed uh, when the Republicans were in control and worked on the Student Loan Bill of Rights and some other issues. And, you know, when Linda got sick, that was uh, really a moment of the Senate coming together to support uh, one of our members. And we uh, all prayed for her. We all hoped for her uh, recovery. And we did bipartisan uh, focus on uh, breast cancer and prostate cancer awareness in her honor and in her uh, in her place. And so, you know, we have worked together very robustly across the aisle. When I was in the minority uh, for a couple years, you know, I took slack from some of my more progressive colleagues for working on the transportation package and some of these big issues. But I think it's important to continue advancing uh, progress. And, you know, uh, I've repaid Curtis King uh, that favor of his help when I was in the minority. I think uh, most of the years we've served together since we took the majority back, he's passed more of the bills than a couple of our members because he brings good ideas that are centered in facts. And uh, I firmly believe that we've got to make sure that central and eastern Washington, that southwest Washington have a seat at the table. And I love Dean Taco. I love Annette Cleveland. I want more of them. Uh, but the fact is the voters aren't going to send us all Dean Tacos and Annette Clevelands. They're going to send us a few Ann Rivers and Linda Wilsons and Curtis Kings. And we'll work with them uh, to get things done. I also just want to say it doesn't mean that we don't disagree. Uh, it means we disagree in respectful, often passionate, but respectful ways. And there are issues that Curtis and I uh, deeply, deeply disagree on. But we've forged an ability to work past those. Um, and sometimes he'll give a really, really impassioned speech on the floor, and I'll sneak up to him afterwards and say, what got in your bonnet this morning uh, that got you so upset about that? So we have that camaraderie, that relationship, that ability to work together. That's what I'm going to bring to the work as lieutenant governor. Lieutenant governor's job is to uh, preside in a way that both sides feel like they were treated fairly. And that means that you know the side that's going to win the vote is going to be happy with that. The side that's going to lose the vote needs to feel like they were heard, like the debate was respectful and fair, like they could offer their ideas. As president, that's the spirit that I'll bring to it. It's the spirit I brought as floor leader to make sure that both sides are heard, but that we come to a vote and move forward. Um, so I'm curious, uh, uh, Marco, on your um, campaign website, uh, you support universal single payer health care. Is that something that's doable at the state level? Does that need to come from the feds? I think it'll take, uh, it will take federal cooperation on some level, which is why we passed the public option and have taken steps uh, during this administration to find other solutions. But uh, if you look at the work that the Sanders-Biden Unity Task Force uh, report produced uh, through the Democratic platform and the convention, they talk about a hybrid where the federal government will work in partnership with states and empower states that want to move forward on a universal single payer model to do that. And two years ago in 2019, we created a work group that is right now meeting uh, monthly to give us a report. And they've got three options. Uh, one is a full single payer state run state uh, maintained. One is a state single payer that's operated by a, a private third party. And then there's a hybrid model. So we will have uh, the sort of business plan uh, for or the business case for how to implement that by the time we meet in January. Uh, I'm desperately hopeful that a new administration is there to take uh, action on this issue, that we get another step. Uh, President or uh, Vice President Biden has talked about building on the ACA uh, and continuing to make uh, uh, access and universal access a priority. So I think there's a way to dovetail this in. Uh, but we've got a sort of two-tiered approach where we're moving forward on the public option now while studying and getting the work ready on how we would implement a single payer. I think that's the most prudent course moving forward. So, uh, Denny, at, at the state level, not your current job, at the state level, how would you approach health care? 
So I think it is important to remember that the legislature passed the public option, and I think it's a little bit at risk. I think it's also important to remember that the single biggest expansion of health care delivery in our nation under the Affordable Care Act uh, is as a consequence of the expansion of Medicaid. And we have to make sure that that stays healthy and that we don't backtrack on it. Now, above and beyond that, I think, however, it's important for us to recognize that 85% plus of the American population has health care until we hit this recession and then all the warts associated with an employer-based system come to the forefront. But for the 85% plus that generally do, what we see is a sensitivity to cost increases. It's not just uh, the fact that a portion of our public does not have access to health care and they need to. We need to have universal health care in this country because it's the only way the entire health care delivery system will work. But for those currently who do, they're experiencing costs that are a multiple of inflation. And so we need to attack the underlying cause of those. Obviously, the single largest increase in health care costs over the last many years has been the increase in the price of prescription drugs. That's a great place to pass. That's a great place to start. And that's why we passed legislation in the U.S. House to bring that under control. We have to build on the success of the ACA and continually expand coverage, including the public option, but I believe also including making more people eligible to participate in Medicaid. And I'm a co-sponsor of a bill to do that at the federal level. And you asked about the sort of contrast between us. This is one of those areas where I want to push harder and push farther. I agree with Danny, we've got to get to universal coverage. I think that single payer is the mechanism that's going to bring everybody under one tent. We've got to do it in a way with the business community and all voices at the table so we don't see costs go up. But this is one of those places where, uh, with all due respect, I think we need to push a little harder, push a little further, and find uh, that innovation that states, you know, we're called the laboratory's democracy for a reason. Uh, this is one of those places where I believe we can innovate and find an answer. And I believe that we may or may not get to single payer. We absolutely must get to universal coverage. But whether or not we get to single payer gets back to your question, Greg, about whether or not that's going to happen in a state legislature. Uh, Marco has indicated previously that he believed the state should pay 100% of the cost of all health care for state citizens. Uh, and I, I think the point is that if the objective, which I think Marco and I share, is to get everybody covered, then the question becomes about how do we get there as expeditiously as possible. And advocating for the state of Washington to assume 100% of the cost of all health care for all citizens in the state, I don't think that gets us to universal health care as quickly as building on what we have done and being aggressive about it. And I certainly am, because again, I think this nation desperately needs to have universal health care. I think it is a moral shame that the leading cause of bankruptcy in this country continues to be, in most years, uh, health care costs. Great. Uh, any other questions? Anybody? Um, we'll move along then and um, uh, tell us, give us your final pitch for why voters should support you and go ahead and uh, mention any prominent endorsements you would like to share. And we'll start with Denny. Well, thank you. I think I think the case has pretty been, been uh, much laid out. I am pleased with the support that we've received thus far, including from the voters. Uh, in the primary, I came in first, and by 154,000 votes, a lot of votes. Uh, and I'm pleased at the support I've received uh, organizationally uh, from mostly traditional Democratic allies. The preponderance of legislative districts and county organizations have endorsed me and a lot of other people. Uh, but I also am humbled, frankly, and honored to have been endorsed by 260 current and former elected officials at the state and local level. These include Governor Gregoire, Governor Law, long-time serving Lieutenant Governor Brad Owen, and many others, and three dozen former and current elected officials in Clark County. Uh, I'm humbled by it, but we take nothing for granted, absolutely nothing for granted, and then the 55 days or however many it is left between now and the end of this election, I'm going to work day and night to continue, I hope, uh, to earn the support of the voters. I think the reason we came in first is because of a recognition of the value of my experience in the midst of these three crises, COVID and the economic recession and the budget challenge. And so we'll continue to, we'll continue to make an appeal based on 
uh, that profile and those arguments. Great, thank you, Marco. Yeah, and I, I will be candid, running against another Democrat all the way to November is not my favorite thing to do. I have a ton <laughs> of respect uh, for Denny, and uh, we've been friends for many years. So this is uh, this is not the uh, the task I think either of us wanted for ourselves. It would have been much more fun to run against a Republican. So it is tough to create contacts, con uh, contrast in this environment. I am really thrilled uh, at the results statewide. Denny had a little lead, but we are single digits uh, and a lot of votes yet to be cast and a lot of new voters. I was excited in Clark County that we're just 6,000 votes apart and three percentage points apart. Uh, and uh, you know, in, in Denny's sort of hometown region, it made me feel like we've got a chance to grow and build uh, on that margin as we move forward. And I think it is because of uh, the bold and transformational message we're talking about. In terms of endorsements and support, really proud of the statewide organizations, the State Labor Council, the uh, Washington Conservation Voters, as well as the Alliance for Gun Responsibility, who I've worked with real closely over the past few years. And then some of the labor organizations that represent folks at the front lines of this moment, uh, grocery workers, nurses, uh, our uh, American Federation of Teachers, my own union uh, endorsing us as well. So really proud to be standing with the folks who are doing the uh, where the rubber meets the road, the tough work in the midst of this crisis. And in terms of elected officials, I think you see that generational uh, divide respectfully again. Uh, Denny's support comes from folks who have served from the 60s uh, to today. My support comes from the folks who are in the legislature right now. Uh, 22 out of 28 Senate Democrats, uh, about half of the House Democratic Caucus. Uh, so much support from folks who have seen me doing the work in Olympia, seeing me make change, seeing me work across the aisle uh, to deliver progress on paid family leave, on transportation, on uh, settling the EU tariffs and getting Boeing a pathway forward. That's the kind of leadership I'll bring to this race. I'm energized. I'm excited. We're going to win this thing and we're going to make some change for Washington. Great. Well, thank you very much for joining us, both of you. Thanks for having me. Thank us. you. Thank, thank you very much. much.